delighted to welcome our first live guest for this morning. She is the co-founder of the award-winning content creation company Storiation and the former editor of Metro Magazine. She's going to be talking about the challenges, opportunities and future of content marketing for magazines. A reminder that if you want to ask her questions, please do use the Q&A button. It's right there where my finger is. And you can chat with her and with the other people in the session using the chat button, which is there. You can do that all the way through. Really look forward to having your questions. It really does make uh, uh, the session fly. But without further ado, our guest is, of course, Lauren Quaintance. Lauren, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Okay. I'm, uh, thank you. I'm, I'm going to talk for about 10 or 15 minutes, um, and then there will be plenty of time for questions. So do post those in the Q&A. Um, just give me a moment to share my screen. I've got a few slides here that hopefully will provide um, a little distraction from my, my face. So here we go. So I think... Um, the MPA called this session uh, content marketing done well. I, I've, I've called it beyond sponsored content because you know, hopefully that will become clear as, as, as we go along what, what I mean by that. Um, I guess I always say that magazine editors are the original content marketers because you know, we've always had that very close relationship with the commercial teams. Uh, creating content um, for brands is something that magazines have always done um, long before content marketing became a buzzword and it really did sort of explode as a buzzword about um, 10 years ago. But I want to make a really clear distinction between um, sponsored content and advertorial on one hand and content marketing um, on the other. Um, because if, as I say here on the screen, you know, content marketing, it might not be what you think, it almost never talks directly about a brand's product, product or services. It is by definition valuable or entertaining content that is aligned with what a brand stands for. So the example I often give, um, which is very simplistic, um, we don't have any um, vacuum cleaner clients, but if you were selling vacuum cleaners, you know, you would be providing um, home cleaning tips. You wouldn't be talking about the sucking power um, of your magazines. And that's a very literal example, but at a sort of a, at a higher level, for example, we have a client in Australia called NRMA Insurance, um, it's probably a bit like uh, AA with that kind of heritage, their brand platform was all about help. So all of the content we create for them is about Australians helping other Australians. So it really is very, very far from that kind of literal idea of creating content about a product. So I guess, you know, we have been talking about brands becoming publishers for a decade and, and Storiation is something I launched uh, eight years ago now. Um, and we were recently acquired by News Corp in Australia. So we're very much back into that sort of publisher network. But this sort of idea of brands becoming publishers has been around for a while. And in a way, I think it often sort of produces a few, you know, chortles from people who actually have worked in publishing, the idea that brands should become publishers. But I think the truth is brands have really heavily invested in their own content ecosystems um, that are completely independent um, of publisher audiences. Some of those include magazines, um, and I've, these are all clients either of, of Storiation or of our um, sister agency, Medium Rare Content Agency. Um, and they have, in some cases, these do include magazines like Qantas, um, Bunnings, David Jones, um, the Chartered Accountants of Australia and New Zealand, all have magazines within that ecosystem. But they really are, it is about um, considering the whole um, ecosystem in terms of the customer journey. How do they reach uh, their customers with content, whether that's through social media, it might be YouTube, it's blogs, it's websites, um, and really understanding the role of content across that customer journey um, for, their, for their clients. So I think that, that that is probably something that, you know, we haven't, we didn't really necessarily see coming. I think when we're on the magazine side and the publisher side, you sort of, the assumption is that it's about accessing our audiences. But in fact, these brands have very much independently built those audiences to the point that they are qu really quite substantial. Um, on the left there is Tourism Australia, which is a client of ours with 4.9 million followers on Instagram. Um, they've got almost 9 million on Facebook. 
Red Bull, which is always sort of singled out as the sort of, you know, the kind of gold standard in terms of um, content marketing, 14.4 million followers, which is pretty extraordinary for an energy drink. I mean, Starbucks um, even um, eclipsing Red Bull with um, 17.8 million followers on Instagram. So the sort of the idea that, you know, that, you know, no one would, would be interested in content produced by a brand is really, um, you know, uh, clearly not true. Um, we are seeing these substantial audiences being built on their own channels. And I'd say that while it's true, you know, to my mind, that content marketing in New Zealand, true content marketing is probably um, in its infancy. I, I would say it's, you know, three to five years behind Australia and Australia is equally behind um, the US where lots of brands are hiring former journalists as chief content officers who have a kind of a seat at the table um, at that sort of um, CMO and higher level in organizations and really building that out within their organizations. But we are starting to see um, New Zealand brands really uh, you know, kind of invest heavily in their own channels and content marketing. A few examples here that I just, by, um, you know, looking around in different in different industries, might attend their new world um, and trade me and looking at their, the size of their audience just on Instagram, but obviously an entire ecosystem um, that is bigger than that. I won't play these videos because I've, uh, I've come to learn that in these remote presentations, playing video is a bad idea. Um, but you, I think I just wanted to place these here to show you that for AMI Insurance, which is one of our clients in New Zealand, what we're doing for them is a very long way from advertorial. Uh, there, these videos are all about, um, they include on the right there, the uh, rapid feed run, which you might be all familiar with, but they're all really examples of everyday New Zealanders who've done something um, extraordinary, done something, gone out of their way, have done something kind for another New Zealander, which is a brand um, platform that they have, a little bit similar to NRMA, um, in Australia, they're both part of um, the IAG group. Um, so that content is around kindness. So you can see that that's a very long way from what you might imagine an insurance company would be producing, which you know at best is often um, how to de-ice your, your windscreen um, in winter. In the past, there's really this big evolution happening in terms of the type of content um, being produced by brand so that absolutely does rival um, what's produced um, by a media company. So what does all this mean for magazines? I just wanted to take you on that journey before we kind of came back to magazines um, because it really is important, I think often to step out of what's happening in your own industry and sort of understand the bigger picture. I think, you know, a few points that came to mind for me um, for magazine publishers and magazine editors to, you know, really um, make the most of this trend um, towards content marketing. I would say first, really to, um, to succeed, you do need to understand um, the role that you play, that to not look at what is being done in the execution within your magazine in, in isolation, really to understand the role it plays in a customer journey um, and, you know, understand what the brand is trying to achieve and what role your small part is, plays in that. Um, I think, secondly, you know, considering how you create content for a brand um, that can be, um, you know, repurposed. There's a term at the moment that... Um, marketers love called content atomization. You know, they do love a buzzword, um, which is really about creating content, you know, and understanding it holistically, then breaking it down for different channels. But at the end of the day, marketers are very focused on return on investment and they do not want to create content in one channel only that can't be used in some other way. So if I was trying to get them into my magazine, I really would be thinking about their channels as well, not just about my audience and, and, and my platform, but how they could create something that actually could be reused and repurposed in other places. I know a lot of you have, a qu have questions. Um, I saw a few questions came in before my session which are all you know inevitably around how you can protect the integrity of what you're doing and your audience um you know in a world where you know brands are, are pushing magazine editors you know further and further in terms of um, the type of content they create um i guess my advice to you would really be to get involved early you know focus and really take the time to understand what a brand is trying to achieve and then how you can create content um that meets an audience need that also aligns with what they stand for. So it kind of works for your audience and it works for them. That is really the sweet spot. And I remember 
when I was at Fairfax, when I was in Australia and I was general manager of travel, um, you know, that entirely really was my job. I would get big briefs from someone like Tourism Australia, would be a competitive reefer against News Corp. And I would spend a lot of time, you know, with a whole team of people unpicking a, you know, 20 page brief, marketing brief, days and days and days and weeks in terms of our response to try and um, you know, get them to spend that money with us. It really was the shift for me where, um, I had to sort of understand the strategy of marketing, um, but how I could make that work for the audience, the Fairfax audience in our channels. And finally, I'd say, you know, really do educate yourself and, um, and try to educate clients um, in the principles and the language of content marketing. I think that's mainly because it's, you know, if you understand what you're talking about, it's much easier to push back. I'm sure you do have the clients that actually do want to talk about the sucking power of their vacuum cleaner, um, that they're not that evolved and, and mature, um, in order to you know, bring them towards some, some great content that essentially is underwritten by them but works for your audience, you do need to understand the principles and language of content marketing so that you can talk to them about how that kind of content about product is lazy and ineffective um, and you shouldn't really be afraid to stand up for that and show them how they can actually get a better return on investment if they're to produce something that's of value um, for the audience that they're trying um, to reach. So there's just a few um, little tips there. This is sort of a short and um, sweet presentation, but um, if there are any questions, I would be very happy to answer them now. I'll have a quick look in the Q&A. Um, um... And Lauren, I'm back as well to ask. I've got a few questions written down, but why don't we take the one that's in the Q&A box first? Okay. It says, there was a recent story in the US trade press that the gloss has somewhat come off publisher brand studios from the day when everyone wanted to follow BuzzFeed and Vice into that space, problem being that brands do not need more agency. Yes, I think that's that's really interesting. And it certainly happened in Australia too. Um, Fairfax had a, a short-lived um, content studio, which was which was modeled on the New York Times and the Guardian um, model. For some reason, these internal um, studios, you know, have really um, succeeded. I think personally having worked inside and outside of um, publishers that it's, it's very difficult to be inside a publisher and not be selling anything but your own channels. So there is that conflict. It's very difficult, um, you know, the pressure. Um, and I see it now being back in part of the News Corp ecosystem that if I'm in meetings with News Corp people, um, you know, they are selling their own platforms and that's not necessarily what a brand wants. So I think, you know, you'd really, um, I mean, News Corp's now by acquiring Storiation and being majority owners of Medium Rare and they have another agency called Suddenly, they have really gone quite hard into this space, but they have kept us quite separate from the from the newspaper business, um, quite deliberately, um, because a lot of what we're doing for brands, you know, does conflict with the with the um, desire to get advertising dollars onto their own platforms, and that's that's the reality. And until you you know restructure the incentives or the sales teams in the way that you know there's so much that you would need to change in order to to shift that um, working from inside a publisher, my view is that that's probably the biggest reason that they've failed. Um, we've got a couple of oh, we've got a couple of other questions here. One from let's take this one from Nicholas Burrows. Um, thank you, Nicholas, for watching and thanks for your question. I'll read it out. Um, in our category, which is homes and interiors, we've seen an uptick in brands investing in creating their own magazines and then asking them to uh, and then asking to distribute them to our subscribers, of course, as a way to differentiate from the cluttered digital space. Do you have a sense on the value brands see in print products in 2021 and ahead? Yeah, I think it, it, it's a good question. And I think it's probably um, broader than um, your space in the sense that um, you, you can really see um, in Australia that there has been uh, that huge investment by brands in, in magazines. And they, they're all types of brands. That's why I included the chartered accountants. There's also um, company directors as uh, associations, one of our clients. So they can be kind of at that more um, agent, the sort of associations end of things. Um, and they, they range up to the more glamorous end of things with, you know, David Jones and fashion magazines and, and the people editing them are the former editors of Elle um, and InStyle. They've all come across to this brand side. So I think that um, there's absolutely, you know, I think there is a real value in that idea of print as the premium product. I guess, um, you know, we are largely producing magazines, people we were monetizing them for um, those brands. So they're the ad sales and, you know, that a lot of people 
obviously what that not everybody can achieve that um, you know and it's certainly not in year one I think they've got to look at that three-year plan if they really do want to um, monetize the magazine um, but but absolutely I think that's a clear trend I don't know so much of that's been the case in New Zealand um, so far but it certainly is um, in Australia um, and then I've got I've got a question really about your business and coronavirus. How how did uh, the business of being in content marketing change during the last kind of eighteen months? I mean, as brands moved from their business as usual brand building and and, and getting messages across into that crisis mode, what was the kind of biggest thing that you noticed and and, and saw in your business? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think um, the big shift for us was really acting um, as a brand user and, um, for a lot of clients. And I use that um, term, um, you know, I, I sort of was sort of uh, dismissing that term a few years ago because nobody was really building a brand newsroom. No one really needed a brand newsroom in the sense of mm. being totally responsive to events. But um, for NRMA Insurance, for example, the example I talked about where it's stories of help, the whole platform, if you look on Instagram for NRMA Insurance, that's all of our content. They are you know, more 400 stories of people who've Australians who've helped other Australians. Well, during um, the bushfires initially, and then in, in COVID, um, we were, you know, kind of really doing stories that were just like a newsroom stories, we had to do things on very quick turnaround, they had to be much more responsive. And they're not really set up um, to do that. Um, mm. You know, how do they get stories that are, that are relevant and of the moment, and also advising them what the of the moment is because that's also a gap for them because marketers tend to be very campaign based so they tend to be planning that's that's the cycles they're used to months and months and months out but you know they had to throw a lot of brand campaigns in the bin um you know content marketing kind of came to the fore as a way for them to be responsive to events um but they needed that guidance around what was the right thing to say at the right time we had a sort of a, a, a sort of a two-speed economy in australia with um Melbourne versus New South Wales last year. Melbourne was, you know, in five months of lockdown and in a very different situation. And what we could produce for that market was very different to what we could produce for Western Australia or New South Wales or, or New Zealand. So um, that was that was all the stuff they were navigating. And they, I just don't think they really have the skills. It's where journalists and, and media companies, we, you know, mm. that's innate to us, reading the moment, understanding what the right content at the right time is. Um, was something that, that we had to really step up and help our clients with. Did you, I was going to say, did you almost find yourself giving advice back to your clients about how they should handle the situation? Because it must have been very confusing for many of them as to how to react. I'm thinking about a Qantas, you know, people who live in the UK, with not many people on this call, but people who live in the UK will know how British Airways reacted to the crisis. Did you find yourself as a kind of sounding board, giving them, giving them some advice about how they should do that? Yeah, I mean, absolutely, absolutely. And also providing those feet on the ground. I mean, in the bushfires, we had, um, not for Qantas, obviously, but for NRMA, I'm still thinking of, we we had people, you know, um, journalists and photographers who were ex-Sydney Morning Herald journalists who were shooting mm. while the fires were, you know, on media passes, while the fires were all around them. That was, you know, we were producing content that was exactly um, the type of content that the media companies were producing but aligned with what the brand needed to stand for i mean mm. the, the advice that's absolutely part of what we do i think um i always say you can choose to ignore um, my advice but that's presumably why um, people pay us so um i always <laughs> share my opinion um and it's not always not not always accepted but that's um but that's definitely a big part of what we do Let's take a very practical question here from my colleague, uh, Natalie, who I suspect is asking this from personal experience a little bit. Um, do you have any tips on best practice when sending clients copy and publications for approval? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, I think that um, tech is a big part of that. I, don't, I think that having, um, you know, kind of clear workflows um, and the technology to support it. I don't know how many of you using things like, you know, Content Station. Um, and Whipster for video approvals, you know, I think that having um, some, you know, technology to support that is really um, important rather than emailing Word documents around and, um, you know, there's other platforms like uh, we've done quite a lot of work with Newsgrid, which is a, um, you know, mm -hmm. a, a content marketing platform that really enables those um, workflows and approvals and seeing where the sort of chain is. I think the messiest thing is, you know, emailing files around and, and losing track of, um, of all of that. I think that's um, you know, and then and then I think 
I think one of the things we try and do is really also talk about what good feedback looks like. And I know, um, you know, in creative agencies, they do this too. You know, they'd even run whole sessions with clients about, you know, how to give feedback um, on a TVC. Um, On a sort of smaller scale, try to give clients about some direction around what we want feedback on, you know, because I think that it's it's incredibly subjective. A lot of what we do and trying to keep um, clients on track is is one of the most difficult um, parts of my job, but giving them some parameters around what we're asking them to look at, um, you know, is, is really important. Um, And then there's a question here that I think is really relevant to this space and something I'd certainly like to know, which is, how are you dealing with the greater sophistication of readers and consumers? Are they getting wise to paid storytelling? Are they turning off or are they starting to see it as an added value to their reading experience, particularly as the quality of content marketing has increased so dramatically in the last few years? Well, we, it's interesting. We've just invested in a, a, a really large piece of research, which I think is the first of this, its kind in this part of the world, um, which is a piece of quant and qual, which I was supposed to um, be talking about at Mumbrella 360 in Sydney um, today, which is obviously um, cancelled, which is why I can be here live happily. Um, but that piece of research so it hasn't actually been released yet, but essentially what we've done is we actually... Um, got a a large number of consumers um, in Australia and got them to keep diaries around their content consumption. So whether there was publisher content or brand produced content, and then really looked at um, how that, um, you know, the attitudes to it, the the kind of how it led to action in terms of their, um, you know, kind of path to purchase, all of that sort of thing. And the most fascinating thing is that, you know, a lot of readers make no distinction between um, the two types of content that is it's, it's good or it's bad content as far as they're concerned and mm. they now have an expectation that brands will produce um, content what what the disconnect for them is that they say something like um, um, you know a large proportion of them say that what is being produced by brands is not good enough so they expect it from brands they're, they're open to it um, but they are saying you're not meeting my needs so that is that is the challenge um, for brands so and I have always really believed this I mean you know look when I was working in magazines and I was very clear about um, you know the way things were tagged and and you know we we had you know clear that this was sponsored content or what it was I always believed then that very few people were even looking at that they really just glanced at the content is this is this good or valuable entertaining or useful in any way um you know they were that that was the criteria and I still believe that to be the case I think it's important to have um you know to, to, to make it clear you know if anyone who wants to know with you know who's produced who's paid for the production of this content um but you know, people are overwhelmed by content. You know, we are live in a world of content overload. It's coming at mm. people from so many different sources. Um, you know, just, I think, but I think the distinction is in, in the challenges around quality. Yeah. Uh, Lauren, we're out of time. Thank you so much for taking the time to come on and join us live today. It was great to hear your insights. Thank you so much. <laughs>